All right. I think we'll get started. I'm going to test out this volume of this microphone. So welcome. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm Heidi Dees. I'm the co-program director of MCT2D. I'm also the lead pharmacist for MCT2D. My clinical practice is at Michigan Medicine at Domino Farms Family Medicine. Uh, so we're going to jump right in and get started because as per the usual, we have a lot to cover um, in short amount of time. So here is just to give you an idea of what we'll be covering in the next two hours. And then I did want to take a moment um, just to acknowledge that it's pretty exciting for these upcoming regional meetings, but this is the first time that we have our specialists joining us. So in the room tonight, we have endocrinology. Um, so what I'd like to do first is, for those of you that work in primary care, if you can go ahead and raise your hand uh, so we all know who we are. <coughs> Fantastic. All right, and then for our endocrinologists that are in the room, if you can go ahead and raise your hand. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then, um, is, do we have any nephrologists here tonight? Fantastic. Welcome. Um, so that we, we hope in the uh, break time that you're able to mingle and network and uh, maybe meet some new friends. All right, yeah. That's great. Um, more exciting news. Back in February, we put a call out uh, to all of you to see if you had ideas for sketches or just general ideas of things that we could use for diabetes education posters. Um, and so we received a ton of uh, entries. Uh, so we took all these fabulous ideas and presented them to our content experts, our steering committee, and our patient advisory board. And they went ahead and selected winners for each region. Um, so I'd like to first say congratulations to uh, Dr. Rollins, who designed this poster. Um, uh, one other thing I want to point out is the design was then submitted, and then our fabulous design team, who's all here, uh, put their magic together to uh, enhance these ideas and bring them to life. Um, do we have, I, I heard Dr. Rollins isn't here, but anybody from Huron Valley practice affiliates? You are. Oh, great, so you didn't picture I saw. Excellent. So we also have one more. Um, this um, is another winner, uh, the Black Bear region. Um, so we heard Dr. Lucas is here today. Um, so congratulations. Um, this is what our design team did with your idea. During the break or at the end of the session, we actually have posters of all of these that you can look through all of the winners and take home with you. We just ask that you take no more than eight total. You can take eight of your favorite one or one of each um, to get there. All right, so now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty and the things that I'd like to talk about. So medication, um, we're gonna primarily focus on truth at the time. I have nothing to disclose. Um, just as a review, we know in healthy individuals that when they're given oral glucose, um, it causes a, uh, in healthy individuals, you see quite the spike, a more robust spike than if uh, IV glucose was given. This, this phenomenon is known as the incretin effect, and it's um, uh, led by two incretin hormones, uh, GIP and GLP. We also know if you look across this graph, you can see that in type 2 diabetes, this is um, much decreased. And so if we move over to the right, you see just another example of this. So when you eat food, the food hits here, activates the gut hormones of GLP and GIP, and then we see that augmentation of insulin secretion. So that brings us to true appetite. So novel uh, mechanism of action, so building upon our GLPs, which are GLP agonists, we now not only have agonists of GLPs, but also GIP, so glucose-dependent insulin trophic polypeptide. Um, I like this picture because I thought it 
offered a nice graphic to show you where there's some synergy between the two hormones. So on the left, we see um, GLP in the red, and then on the right, you see GIP um, in the green. And so if we focus on the pancreas, we see in both cases, we have increased insulin secretion. And then if we focus on CNS, oops, um, CNS, you're going to have decreased food intake. So again, this is why we, um, which you'll eventually see the decreased weight loss. I do want to point out here that in the stomach, um, the decreased uh, gastric emptying is really tied to GLP only, not GIP. So we want to keep that in mind. Another caveat about terzepatide um, in regards to the delayed gastric emptying is um, it, it is most pronounced on the, the first dose, um, and it's the largest kind of reaction that first uh, first dose. Now, the caveat here is the first dose is the first efficacious dose. So we'll get to the starting dose, which is 2.5 milligrams, um, but it's really the effective dose of 5 milligrams. And from 5 milligrams on, you see decreased, um, diminished kind of effects of that gastric emptying. Um, this is also similar to dulabutide, so we're going to be talking about a lot of similarities uh, with trisopatide and dulabutide. I'm sure everybody in this room knows that these are labeled, indicated for type 2 diabetes. Uh, I'm sure we all also know that there's lots of people prescribing uh, for non-type 2 reasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what we know that the populations that haven't been studied in is type 1 diabetes and um, any patients with a history of pancreatitis. All right, so diving in. You'll see the six pens across the top. So there's quite a broad uh, dosing titration. Um, so we're starting off at 2.5, much like uh, liraglutide and semaglutide, just a sensitizing dose for side effects. And then every four weeks, we're going to go ahead, and if patient is tolerating, we're going to increase. Um, keep in mind, max dose is 15 milligrams. There is no need for hepatic or renal dose adjustment. Um, but I'd like to point out, here comes the similarities with dulabutide. It is a single-use, single-dose pen. Now, this might then cause you to think, hmm, there's a lot of titrations to do. And, and so how is the best way to get patients through this process? Um, especially when you have some patients that get discounted copays from mail order, and how are we going to deal with this? Um, and the other thing is the increments are not like dulabutide, where you can use those first three doses of doubling up. We have that single increment of 2.5 milligrams. <coughs> so what I would suggest is kind of keeping it simple and keeping it local. So write a patient a prescription for 2.5 milligrams, put a refill on, see how they do, see if they're going to titrate after the four weeks. Move them on up to five milligrams. Keep doing that until you get up to their dose that's going to be their maintenance dose. At that point, that you have understood kind of where your dose is going to be for that patient, then send it to mail order to get the 12 pen. Um, <clears throat> because otherwise, you're going to be locked into long titration periods. <clears throat> um, so, hopefully, that makes sense. Finally, uh, this is an auto-injector, just like dulabutide, um, so no need for pen needles, nice and easy for our patients. Um, I would point out, though, um, I guess I look at these pens, and I'm not quite sure what Lily was thinking, because um, it looks pretty darn similar to dulabutide. Uh, so I always worry about patients recognizing and making sure. Um, I know I have a couple husband and wife pair patients, and I always worry about when they're on different meds of drugs if they're going to mix it up. So I think this is yet another uh, example of yeah, perhaps we could have like made the cap a different color or something, but I don't work for them. Um, anyhow, moving on to side effects. Not surprisingly, we see that the side effects are pretty darn similar to GLP. So no big surprises here. 
I'm going to dive into a little bit of the data. Nausea, diarrhea being the most common, 10 to 20 percent. Um, discontinuation rate, around 5 percent, so not too bad. Um, and we'll dive into that a bit deeper too. All right, so another caveat um, that I was a little surprised to see, but this is in the package labeling, um, that terzepatide reduces um, the absorption of oral contraceptives. So they actually recommend backup method for the start of the drug, and then every time there's a dose increase. So that could be for the first six months of therapy. Um, so if you have a patient, childbearing age, this might be a conversation that you want to have up front to see if you want to switch to a non-oral contraceptive, um, because it is going to be something you need to consider. Mechanism is not known. Um, and what's also strange is that with GLPs, they did all these studies, and this was not found. So I am not sure what it is about terzepatide, um, but it's there, it's labeled, you need to know about it, um, so people are prepared. What is the failure rate? Sorry? What is the failure rate? What percentage is in the study failed? How many? Oh, the AUC? It reduces the AUC by 20%. <clears throat> so. Uh, all right. Has anybody had any patients on GLPs that have come in and talked to you about maybe not being able to tolerate alcohol anymore? Okay. So this was news to me as well. Um, <clears throat> so this was brought to my attention a couple weeks ago. Uh, so I was like, hmm, let me look into this because I haven't heard this. Uh, so I dove into PubMed. There is absolutely nothing. Um, but this has gotten across uh, social media outlets, internet, uh, they did a whole story on today, um, so you know how it works, patients are going to hear this, um, and so I just thought I'd highlight this, um, this lady talked about, uh, she, she doesn't like the way she feels anymore, and she gave an example of one night being out, um, had three beers in a four hour period, and it was the first time in her life she ever physically felt awful and vomited and does not touch alcohol anymore. Others um, in the story talk about how just the smell of alcohol makes them nauseous. Um, there were several physicians quoted in this um, article, and again, we're not sure. I think all of us might think it could be delayed to the tie to the delayed gastric emptying. Um, so I bring it to your attention just because I feel like um, we. We see things, I want you aware. I'm not saying there's any correlation because I haven't seen those zero case reports, just absolutely nothing. Um, but it's certainly taking over um, a lot of the social media outlets. So, something to know. Oops, I want to get back to <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so this was just a quick way for me to dive in and give you a visual on the numbers. But as you can see, as I said, the side effects in comparison, um, the far right teal terzepatide, looking at dulaglutide and semaglutide, um, just to kind of orient you, award three, sustain one, surpass one, all monotherapy trials. The award 11, sustain forte, are when we had those individual drugs with expanded labeling. Um, so with dulaglutide, looking at three milligrams and four and a half, and then the sustained forte when they added on the two milligram. So again, across the board, pretty similar. So um, <clears throat> um, and then back to that uh, discontinuation rate. So if you remember, I said it was about three to um, six percent. So here you see across those same studies, um, as we went up in most cases. We saw a slightly higher discontinuation rate, but nothing higher than terzepatide, 15 milligram at 6.6%. Um, across the board, the most common uh, reasons for discontinuation, GI side effects related. When I dove into the supplementary materials, um, each of these side effects, no more than 2%. <clears throat> so again, pretty small, um, but... All right, so with hypoglycemia, um, this is just with monotherapy. You see a beautiful chart of just zeros. 
Again, this shouldn't be surprising if we think back to that mechanism of action that is glucose dependent insulin secretion. Um, so hopefully this should make sense. If we then add in when terzepatide is added to other medications, so in the top uh, chart, we have surpass 5. Um, in this trial, patients were on basal insulin and metformin. Um, and so then we do see um, some reports, obviously still small, but there's reports of hypoglycemia. The bottom chart is surpass 4. And in that study, patients were on metformin, sulfonylureas, or uh, SGLT2. And so what they did in the supplementary materials is carved out and looked at hypoglycemia amongst the patients that were on sulfonylurea and those that weren't. And so as you see, we do see reports of hypoglycemia above that zero on patients with sulfonylurea. So take home, if you have a patient with basal insulin on sulfonylurea, go ahead and make sure we're thinking about maybe dose reduction at the very least you're telling your patients to closely monitor their blood glucose. If you want to give them a self-de-escalation cycle, that's great. Um, or just contact you if they start to have uh, episodes of hypoglycemia. So surpass uh, five, um, I thought maybe you might want to know what they did in terms of that insulin adjustment. And so they, um, again, patients had to have at least 23 weeks of basal insulin. And then at the point of randomization, they kind of split the populations. So they looked at patients with A1Cs of 8 or less, and then patients that had A1Cs of, of a higher percent. And so in the subset of patients that had that lower A1C, they went ahead at the start and reduced the insulin dose by 20%. Um, <clears throat> so then, as you can see in this group, again, the uh, A1C less than seven, we said we didn't start seeing insulin doses coming down until they got to those higher doses of trisepatide. Um, in our patients that had higher A1Cs, sorry, my box, um, but it was over here at the 15 milligrams um, when you saw that insulin dose coming down. So takeaways, um, certainly, to consider, um, you know, with lower, close to goal A1Cs, maybe doing a, a, a start off basal dose reduction. And then again, in those patients with higher A1Cs, making sure they're closely monitoring their blood sugar and giving them instructions on what to do uh, for one. Are we okay to try to keep questions at the end? Okay. All right, so another similarity with GLP has the same box warning. Uh, so nothing new here. So we should be um, having the same practices where we're screening for self and family history of medullary um, thyroid carcinoma and men too. Um, and then I also wanted to call your attention. I don't know if you've seen this on our website, um, but we have a new resource <clears throat> um, for your patients. So this is patient facing. And what we wanted to do with this resource was have you have a uh, a patient information sheet that talks about these side effects, talks about mitigating strategies for this, really talks about some of the rare things and, and the things behind um, these drugs, why you might take them for heart failure, why you might take them for something other than diabetes. And so our hope is with this uh, resource that it's something uh, patient-centered and different than the good old uh, stapled label that you get at the pharmacy that lists every single side effect, then they get home and they read it and they freak out. So we're, we're hoping to decrease that. Oh, okay. oh yep. Okay. <clears throat> so a very busy side, but I wanted to try to squeeze in as much as I could for comparison's sake. So to orient you, uh, first column from the headers is dual glutide again, so the award 11 trial. Then sustained forte semaglutide up against surpass two. So these uh, two trials on the left, again, these are the higher doses of those agents compared to terzepatide. And then I chose all of these because they had the most similar baseline medications. So majority, um, all of them were on that formant. 
Um, the only difference here is the semaglutide one, about 50% of the patients in that study were on sulfonylureas. As you can see, as we move across, we see similar, but when you get to that final dose of trisepatide, it really starts to pull away at about 10%, 10 to 20% higher than the other two. For me, oh, <laughs> sorry about this. Um, for the, the weight category, um, weight reduction from baseline, this is truly where trisepatide starts to pull away from the other GLPs we have. So more than two times um, the weight loss seen with the other two. And I think this teal box, uh, it's past here, but 80% is that number. So 80% of the patients in the study achieved a weight loss of greater than 10%. Um, and as we move down, we get down to 36% of patients in the study um, lost more than 15% of their weight. And if we compare that to the highest dose of semaglutide at 2 milligram, it's about half. And so that's getting upwards close to bariatric surgery. Um, so I think this is things of why we're going to start seeing more and more of these drugs and, and the impact that they can have. So. All good news, all great things, but just to kind of pause, some of the unknowns that remain. We do not have cardiovascular data yet. So that trial surpassed CVOT, isn't out until fall of 2024, so maybe we'll see it in the literature somewhere around 2025. Um, so I think this should cause, it causes me a little pause um, of which patients I'm gonna think about this medication for at this point. Um, I did want to call your attention to this review article that I found, and I thought just the, the phrase here, overall there's a number of unknowns. Um, the evolution of the role of GIP agonism is less beneficial for the unanimously positive role of GLPs. So I think that really kind of sets home um, where we're at at this point and, and why we need to be patient and, and think about who might the best patients be for this medication. So I always want to consider cost, too. Um, so I did want to give to you some updates from our um, published um, coverage guide. So this first came out, I think, beginning of, of February. And so within less than a month, of course, the payers had some big updates. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. So these <clears throat> yellow boxes that you see around Blue Cross Blue Shield, Priority Health and United show that these um, trisepatide is, is a preferred drug. But then you see, you can't really see, but there's a yellow circle and it's kind of a clock. And what that is to symbolize is previously it was a PA symbol, but we're using this yellow clock to symbolize lookbacks. And so I learned that these lookbacks actually happen at the time of adjudication. So when the medication is sent to the pharmacy, behind the scenes, um, in many cases, they're looking for previous diabetes meds or specific ICD-9 codes. If they find those, there won't be a PA requirement. It'll just go through. And so I think that's really important to find out because this really does cut down on work, and it shouldn't be, I think, our reaction to the big red symbol of, of PA and, and the time that that can cause. If we switch back over to the left side of the screen, um, I did want to point out, we did some updating here. Priority Optimize represents 10% of Priority Health plans. Um, but when we originally had this, the link didn't really link up to this uh, criteria here, so I just wanted to go through it. Um, so for patients with A1Cs greater than 7% or less than 9%, um, one of these two things must occur. So either they will have had to have trial and failure of at least two oral meds, or have been on insulin for three months with six months of uncontrolled A1C. So if those uh, one of those things is met, then um, we move on to a, a true prior authorization. It's not the look back. And then as a reminder for our Michigan Medicaid patients, it remains non-preferred, um, and a clinical PA is required. Okay. 
Um, if we move on to our Medicare population, so these are looking at Advantage plans. Um, we uh, have an update of the United Health, so they added terzepatide to their preferred drug list. Um, so that's the update there. All right, so copay cards. So I'm always trying to find ways, even if it's covered, we all know that can kind of be a little bit of a teaser. Um, so for our patients with commercial coverage, there are copay cards available. As we all probably know as well, the copay card isn't uh, the end all be all. Um, so on this side of if terzepatide is on their formulary, so it's a it's a covered medication, patients can get a copay down to twenty five dollars, uh, but it's a max cap of one hundred and fifty dollars. So let's say they have one of those high deductible plans and their copay is really three hundred, it's only going to take it down one hundred and fifty dollars. Annual caps listed there, restrictions is basically any number of fills in the calendar year. So these copay cards will expire by the end of the calendar year in December. This other side of the graph here without terzepatide um, coverage is um, offers $500 off. The last time I checked, four pens is about $1,200. Um, so I don't know too many of my patients that are like, yeah, I'll go out and spend $700 for a med. Um, so it's there. It's also interesting that it ends two months from now, so they're not even getting through the titration process uh, to even reap the benefits of this. So is what it is. Um, the last thing I think that hits home for me, and when I think about which patients that I might want to use this medication in, I think of my um, Medicare patients. And so I'm sure we're all very familiar with Lily Cares. I use it a lot for Bezoglar, for Trulicity. Um, Terzepatide is not listed on Lily Cares. So there is no Medicare uh, patient assistance program at this time for this medication. So just to make sure we get that. So getting to the nitty gritty, who is the ideal patient? I don't think I have any, um, you know, perfect patient for you. I think in patients that aren't making their A1C goals, this is worth a try. I think with patients that might be near their A1C goals, but perhaps haven't seen the weight loss that they might need, this is also a great place for this. Now, in those patients, I think we need to think about their cardiovascular risk. And if they're high risk, if they have established ASCBD, I'm going to pause. I'm going to look what other medications they're on. If they're on an SGLT2, we're getting some cardiovascular protection there. So maybe we can go ahead and switch. Um, so, and then in patients maybe younger, without a uh, very high risk, we could consider this. But then I remind you again about that OCP interaction. Um, and making sure we're having that conversation with patients and making decisions on what to do there. So real quick, I wanted to run through uh, some of the updates from the ADA standards. Um, so this was uh, released late December. Um, so don't worry, but this is the newest crazy algorithm. Uh, so very busy, but we're going to sit here and kind of walk through it for a second. So we're going to first focus on this very top. So back in 2022, that top um, called out first line therapy, and specifically in the second line, it says includes metformin. So this is what how we've all practiced, right, for years and years, lifestyle and metformin. I, I think uh, lecturing uh, to my students as I do, I'm like, oh, everybody needs metformin. Everybody needs metformin. So what we see now in 2023 is you see that metformin is removed from that um, lifestyle line. Um, and so we go from lifestyle to then further breakdown between risk of um, cardiorenal risk versus glycemic and weight management goals. So it's really trying to say, look at your patient and what do we need to focus on? Are we focusing on cardiorenal or are we focus on um, weight and glucose? Now, then, there we go. So now we're going to go, if we're looking at that big algorithm that I showed you, 
Uh, first, uh, we're going down the heart failure section, and so you see a lot of SGLT2s with CKD. We see a recommendation of SGLT2s as well. So to wrap things up, I kind of want to just go over a question that I get often in clinic regarding SGLT2s. And so I know you all know this. Um, this is just the basic intro dosing. And then if patients are tolerating it, we can go ahead and move up to those maxes. Um, but I think the thing we often consider is that there's glycemic cutoff, there's renal cutoffs that then are, serve as the cutoff for where you're going to get glycemic benefit. But I've gotten questioned before, wait a second, Heidi. It's 45? I thought it was 20. I don't understand where this is coming from. And so I want to remind you all that these two particular SGLT2s, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, have non-diabetes indications. So we have indications in the heart failure sector and CKD. And so this is where the confusion kind of comes in, but hopefully uh, my tables can help a little and you can create that visual memory. Um, I just wanted to explain here the check marks mean in the respective. So if we look across with epigoflozin, heart failure, whether it's half pep or half ref, we have indication uh, for decreased uh, CV events and decreased hospitalizations in that population. The question marks as we move to the right under CKD is it doesn't have the indication yet, um, but I don't know if you're aware of the publication that came out, the EMBA kidney trial in early January. Um, that showed a 28% lowering of per progression of kidney disease. Um, and 96% of the population had type 2 diabetes. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, next 6 to 12 months. It is in front of the FDA at this point. Um, so I would imagine it'll get the indication here. If we're looking at dapagliflozin, it already has the indication in the CKD population. So again, this is CKD with or without diabetes. Um, and then dapagliflozin has an indication in HEF-REF, but we just had the DELIVER trial that came out. So again, that's another trial in front of the FDA. We'll probably see um, some indication changes there. So here's my table. Hope you can see it. Um, but this is where the lowered GFR cutoffs come from. So in patients that have heart failure or CKD, we have some different cutoffs. So if you look at dapagliflozin, um, it, remember, has the heart failure, half ref And so those patients with a GFR of 25 to 45 can stay on that 10 milligram uh, dose. Now, you might ask, well, what happens if they have diabetes? They can be on it. They just aren't getting any more glycemic benefit from that drug. It's still protecting their heart and protecting um, and, and use in heart failure, um, but we're not getting that glycemic control. As we move over to epagliflozin, the dose here is 10 milligrams, so that's kind of nice. Hopefully, between those two meds, you can just remember 10 milligram, um, but we don't have labeled directions there, but the GFR cutoffs that I listed are per the studies. So hopefully that kind of helps um, how we sort this out. Um, yeah. So with that, I think I finished with... Um, yeah. huh? We can take a few questions. All right, I tried to get through it all. <laughs> so what, uh, thank you, number one. And um, what questions do you have? Yeah, it started at the point of randomization before they started the 2.5. I myself didn't understand why they did that, but I think it just had to do with the study protocol. So, I mean, my, I think, clinical way of doing that is I would probably wait till we get up to a dose of 5 milligrams because the study showed we didn't see much hypoglycemia when we had that overlap with basal insulin. Um, but I will also say I've had patients on starting doses of GLP that we think um, aren't affecting their glucose, and we started to see a drop. I, 
it could just be that they're not eating as much because they're starting to feel the side effects, but Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Heart failure uh, reserved ejection fraction. So that's the HEF ref. And then HEF PEF is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Reduced. Reduced. Yeah. So is one you're talking about making diet heart failure versus heart failure? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Where did that come from? Um, <laughs> I've never heard of it. Oh, when did they change the Why word? did they change? I, I don't know when cardiology decided to change their their uh, classification. So sometime since I finished doing hospital medicine a few years ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll pass it on and get the program going. Uh, thank you.